Uh, our speaker tonight is uh, Ann O'Donnell. Ann is a uh, professor of history at New York University. She uh, received her AB degree from Princeton, an MA from uh, University of California, Berkeley, PhD from, uh, from Princeton. Now, she's a historian of 20th century Russia, whose first book was Taking Stock, Power and Possession, uh, the Revolution and Revolutionary Russia. And she's working on a, a, a couple of new projects, including one on uh, poverty in Russia uh, after World War II. But again, I'm so pleased that we're able to, to get Professor O'Donnell uh, here. And please give her a uh, Camden County College welcome. All right, yes, it's on. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for coming out tonight. Thank you so much to Camden Community College and the Center for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, the brief, as I mentioned to Jack before speaking, is a monumental one. How to, to wrap together for you uh, a story of Stalin and the Soviet Union in uh, its most consequential decades from the mid-1920s to the mid-1950s. Uh, it's a tall order, but that's what I'm here to try to provide for you tonight. Uh, let, me, let me get settled here with the PowerPoint as well. So I'm going to begin tonight with a couple of framing questions for you. Uh, a set of ideas and thoughts about what Soviet dictatorship was and how it was made. Stalin's life story is the answer to that question in a certain sense, because Stalin was not just a dictator of the Soviet Union, he was the creator of a particular kind of dictatorship within the Soviet Union that was phenomenally significant, not just for the 160 million to 200 million people who lived within the Soviet Union, but for the entire world. Unlike other dictators, Soviet or otherwise, a history of Stalin, a history of the Soviet Union can also function as a way of telling the story of global politics in the 20th century, in one biographer's view. Stalin shaped his country, he was shaped by it, in ways that few other people could or will ever be able to imagine. The power he wielded was immense, albeit not total. His crimes were otherworldly, and his life was remarkable, but also profoundly isolated and strange. He was the touchstone for modern Russia, pictured here on the eve of the First World War, uh, when Stalin was a young revolutionary, having dropped out of the seminary in a city ca then called Tiflis, now called Tbilisi, in Georgia, in the North Caucasus. Oh, this, does this have a pointer? in the North Caucasus region, in, in red down there beneath the yellow Russia uh, section. Um, he was the touchstone for modern Russia, and he was the archetype for modern dictatorship as a political form. So modern politics is fundamentally mass politics. It's fundamentally the question of how do you involve the entire population in political life, whether democratic or not. And this came to be the case not with 1914, not with the rise of Stalinism, but in fact, one might say in 1789, with the French Revolution and the idea of democracy, the obligation to involve the population in political life. But in fact, mass politics did not have to be democratic politics. That is one form of mass political participation, but not the only one. The other form, or one of the other forms, was that experienced in the Soviet Union and built and made there. This was dictatorial mass politics. And this is what Stalin was the master of. And the Bolshevik party that he led. That is the name of the Communist Party uh, from 1903 when it split into two sects, the Menshevik section and the Bolshevik section, but both were communist, communist parties. So uh, even in places that do not embrace democratic principles of governance, there is an attempt to accommodate the rise of mass participation in political life. And the masses are coming out in all kinds of ways at the dawn of the 20th century at this moment that this map depicts. They're coming out in the rise of the phonograph, in mass culture, 
in the idea, in, in the spread of print and literacy that is booming across Russia in these years, albeit at a much smaller level than in Western Europe. Stalin, Stalinism, as you can see from the sweep of this map, this is the territory that is about to fracture in the First World War, but which Stalin in large part, Lenin and Stalin are going to reconstitute as a new kind of empire, the Soviet empire. Stalin built a personal dictatorship across 11 time zones, one sixth of the Earth's land mass. That's what that is up there. And what he built represents one such attempt at thinking about how to involve the masses in politics. Whatever one thinks of the politics of the Soviet regime, it's impossible to deny that his was a strikingly successful attempt. Stalin ruled Russia for nearly 30 years from roughly 1924, when the, when the founder of the Soviet Union, Vladimir Lenin, uh, who you've already heard about, I understand, in this series, when he died after two years of debilitating illness, until Stalin's own death in 1953. So our aim this evening will be to characterize his power and Soviet power to illuminate the nature of his dictatorship. Stalin was a despot, but he built a personal dictatorship uh, within an illiberal power structure that had been erected previously by Lenin. But even despots cannot rule alone. And that's one of the key questions that I hope to help untangle a bit. Even despots cannot rule by themselves. They need a couple of things, really. They need an apparatus, a state that has reach across a landmass of this size, um, and they need clients, people who are willing to attempt to implement what they want to accomplish across this apparatus all over, all over the country. Uh, Stalin built those clients all over the Soviet Union, really, but particularly in his native Georgia. Um, what I'm going to contend is that you need more than that. Stalin couldn't do it all. He wasn't every place, and yet people behaved as though he were. How do we understand that phenomenon? How do we get to the heart of what made regular people fall in line with the maxims being propounded outside of Moscow? How did this machine work? We cannot appreciate Stalin without all of these other people who were working in his image without the thousands of lower level Stalins who were imitating him, who were trying to guess at what he wanted, trying to do what he wanted ahead of him even expressing that he wanted it. If getting, getting through to them is how we can start to understand the nature of the power that he projected across a space so monumentally large as the Soviet Union, spread out so far and wide. Under Stalin's rule, surrounded by a hostile capitalist world, the Soviet Union made good on its ideological imperative to catch up with the capitalist West, to build huge factories, to spread literacy, to stamp out private property in the market, to collectivize the vast peasant interior. Those efforts were so successful, so successful, that when the time came for the Soviet Union to go toe to toe with Russia's historic rival and the greatest industrial power of its era, Nazi Germany, the Red Army was supplied with the necessary airplanes and tanks, it had the food it needed to keep its men fighting, and it had a home front, a population that held up under an unfathomable strain, the onslaught of the Wehrmacht, the German army under Hitler's control. Not only did the Soviet Union not break apart, it beat the Germans back all the way to Berlin. How did he do it? How did this place do it? So these are some of the questions that we'll be asking tonight. And like I said, Stalin didn't do it alone. Stalin was not the 15 million men in that army. He was not the hundreds of million, you know, the, 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 the 100 plus million people back home living under that strain for all those years. But at the same time, within the framework of Soviet power, very little of this would have happened without Stalin had it not been for him and his vision. So the dilemmas he faced once in power were not unique to him. They were inherited in certain respects from the Russian Empire and either circumstance or mentality. And what are these inherited 
mentalities that Stalin's working with. Well, one of them is the map that you see right there before you. It's the geopolitical dilemma that Russia faces. This is a historic dilemma. This is in no way one that Stalin has invented. It's one that existed in large part since 1700 and the rise of Peter the Great. And this is that uh, Russia is a massive, frigid land empire with no discernible borders, no natural mountains or, or oceans to contain it, but also to protect it from the outside world. And this sense of um, a certain, I won't, I won't say fragility, but an awareness of the uh, outside competition pounding at the gates, potentially or otherwise, is embedded in Russian statecraft in the 18th century, the 19th century, and in the 20th century. Stalin feels it too. And it has a particular effect in Russia. Russia did not have the native economic industry, the capital reserves of the West, and if it was going to get these attributes of development to protect itself from the outside world, it would have to import them. This is what Peter had recognized centuries before, and it was the guiding strategy of the Russian czars. If they're going to marshal the resources to protect and make Russia strong, they will have to uh, bring them in from the outside, and they will do that not through particular businesses or uh, the sorts of more familiar stories you might think of in Britain or France of um, inventions, but rather through the Russian state. The Russian state is the only way that they can get enough money and enough resources to bring these tools, these attributes of modernity into Russia. And that makes the Russian state a funny kind of creature. It means that the Russian state is trying to modernize the population, rather than the population being the sort of font of industry driving things forward. It means that the state has taken on a weird job, a job that the British state, for example, doesn't fulfill, the French state doesn't fulfill. The state is training cadres, it's getting men together and sending them west so they can learn how to be engineers, and then bringing them back to Russia and hoping that that's all they pick up when they come back, hoping they don't also pick up, oh, I don't know, democratic politics, liberalism, just the engineering, please, not the rest. That doesn't work out too well. That's not our story tonight. That's the story of the Russian Empire. But you want to know something? Stalin's going to have to do the same thing under a different coda, a different star, the star of communism. But he's going to have to do the same thing as the czars before him. But Stalin, so the revolutionary role of the state is going to persist. He's going to keep doing it that way. Um, he's not going to send so many people abroad. He's going to bring them to him. There are going to be foreign enclaves that will live within the Soviet Union, that will teach factories. I mean, he, he imported, he would make deals with companies like Siemens, a lot of German firms in particular, to ship whole factories over, plus the men who knew how to put them together. Um, so Stalin would do this not just in the name of catching up with the West and defending his territories, but here was the difference. He did this in the name of communist ideology. And what that meant was skipping over a whole stage in world development that the capitalist West was going through as he understood it. And that was the wrenching, painful, often violent stage that was industrialization, that was people living in slums, that was massive unemployment and hunger and poverty. This was the dream. He was going to do it for communism, to skip over the stage of capitalism that had been so violent in the West. Because if you're going to modernize after everybody else, why not benefit from having watched what they've gone through? Why not try and take the good stuff and leave behind the bad stuff? Leave behind the slums. Leave behind the Manchesters, the Lower East Sides of the world. 
Catch up and overtake, skip ahead. This is the idea. So it's, it's the same but different, what Stalin is about to embark on. Um, at the same time, as much as the communists wanted to build a new world, as much as they had this utopian vision, they were inevitably, and Stalin too, the products of the autocratic system, the czarist system that they sought to overturn as revolutionaries. And what does that mean more than anything else? It means that they're a conspiracy. The czars, from Peter the Great to Nicholas II, the last of the Romanov dynasty, did not allow the population to participate in politics. They did not allow a free press to function. The czars suppressed not just liberal parties and not just revolutionary parties, but conservative parties. Parties that advocated for the monarchy. Because who were all these people to participate in politics? That's not their job. Their job is to be loyal servants of the czar. So if you want to do politics, in the Russian Empire, there's only one place to do it. It's not Moscow, it's not St. Petersburg, it's underground. It's in conspiracy. It's learning how to pass notes to one another, how to keep what they called conspiratorial apartments in cities all across the empire, and Stalin was a master of this. Stalin was a master of conspiracy. Stalin was a master bank robber. Many of the Bolsheviks were, in fact. That was how they funded their activities, as they robbed banks, particularly in the Caucasus. There was a little bit of banditry dimension to what he and others did. Um, and he was a master of a sort of secretive, paranoid even, way of doing politics that he would never shed, that none of them would ever shed, that they would bring with them when they could come above ground even when they didn't need it anymore, even when they were the ruling party, the Bolsheviks, after seizing power in October 1917. So these are sort of our frameworks uh, for thinking about the young man. Here is, here is the advent. I was talking about the importance of mass politics. Well, it won't surprise you to learn that the tighter the czars tried to keep a lid on mass politics, once the First World War comes, to pass, and men are dying for the empire. They are unwilling to live under the czarist grip any longer. Russia erupts in mass protests in 1917, first in the February Revolution of 1917, and then after the Bolsheviks seize power in October. And the Bolsheviks have to find a way to ride this wave. They have to find a way to incorporate these images, this participatory process that you're seeing into their politics, whatever it is. So paradoxically, the dictatorship is going to be something that lets them do this. Here is the Bolshevik in chief, Vladimir Lenin, in power in the Kremlin. And this is a monumental moment. This is the first known image of Lenin in the Kremlin, the historic seat of Russian power. He's with a man named Vladimir Banch-Bruljevich, who was one of his secretaries. This photograph was taken after a failed assassination attempt against him in order to show the population that he was alive and that he was healthy. But it symbolizes a lot. It symbolizes the rise of Bolshevik power within the historic structure of the Russian Empire that I've been talking about so far. Um, this is a regime led by Lenin, who was, no one was more conspiratorial than Lenin. Lenin spent almost none of his adult life in Russia, of course, it should be noted. He was mostly in exile in Europe. Stalin did not have that same experience. Stalin stayed within the Russian Empire, albeit on its peripheries. First, you know, he was raised in Georgia. He abandoned, to his mother's chagrin, he abandoned his studies in the seminary. Although he continued to speak like a seminarian, he had a sort of incantation style of speak. He was not a gifted public speaker. He was not a gifted public orator. His skills lay more in organization and conspiracy. Um, but he always retained that, that imprint of the seminary in his, pol in his political style. Um, both of them, both Lenin and Stalin, were master cons uh, conspiracy 
well, theorists in a certain sense. They came to power via a secretive coup, and they achieved rule through ruthless suppression of a counter-revolutionary movement that was both real and imagined. Lenin is the embodiment of the Communist Party. He was its founder, its chief ideologue. And um, I'm not going to you know, go deeply. My subject tonight is Stalin, and we have enough material to cover just with him. But it's important to say a few words about how Lenin set Stalin up for power uh, through his last years in office and his death. Lenin was the party's founder and chief ideologue, as I said. He did not, however, devote a great deal of thought to what would happen when he was no longer at the head of the regime. When that regime came to power, it orbited not around the Communist Party, uh, but around the new state that Lenin had built. Indeed, there was not really a point of the Communist Party anymore after 1917. The conspiracy had been realized. They had seized power. Why do you need a conspiratorial party once you are the people in power? It turned out to have several uses. And Stalin was, in fact, the man who cracked the code on the Communist Party, as I'll speak about in just a moment. But the, 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 the point that I want to make here is that Lenin, in fact, did not make extensive use of the Communist Party in his technology of rule, shall we say, in the way that he practiced his power and politics. Um, he ruled through the state 60% of his correspondence. If you go through his archives and see, well, who was Lenin sending letters to? 60% of his letters were going to the state. Only 14% of them were going to party institutions. Um, when we explain the transition from Lenin to Stalin, we have to also trace this evolution from a party that is secondary, indeed, by some accounts, a party that is on its deathbed in 1919, 1920 a party whose membership is falling in that period. Because let's remember, does Russia have much of an, interior, an, an industrial base that is supposed to be the natural social base of a communist party? It does not. It does not. Russia is at most, at most 12% worker or proletarian in the early 1920s at this moment. It is over 80% peasant agricultural at the moment when Stalin takes power. So we have to trace this evolution from a party that is secondary to the revolutionary state to a party that controlled that state. Lenin has his first stroke in May 1922. He returns to work. He recovers fairly rapidly from that bout of illness. But the same is not true of his recovery from his second stroke in December of that year, which leaves him partially paralyzed and increasingly unable to speak. In March 1923, he loses the power of speech more or less fully. And he is effectively confined to his retreat at Gorky. He reads voraciously. He is uh, an avid consumer of Soviet political life and the doings in Moscow, what's going on. But he is not privy to a lot of critical information already about what's happening. Already, the men who he leaves behind, men like Stalin, men like Leon Trotsky, the party's chief ideologue, Lev Kamenev, Grigory Zinoviev, historic leaders of the Bolshevik party, they are sitting in Moscow wondering how it is that they are going to govern without him, how it is that the machine that he has created will work without him at the center. Lenin had enormous charisma, and his charisma powered the early Soviet regime. Uh, it pervaded the entire state system through which he governed. But the one thing Lenin had not done, had not gotten around to yet before he fell ill, was creating a plan for succession. So what person or group of people could take his place when he finally dies in 1924? And how would they rule? The revolutionary state, the revolutionary society that Lenin left behind was in many respects a mess. It was petty fiefdoms. It was incompetence and drunkenness. It was a uh, um, deeply held belief in certain pockets, but also deep frustration with the first several years of Soviet power and what it had uh, 
how the ways in which it had transformed Russian society, a sense that the revolution had not uh, come to fruition in the way that many people had hoped and expected. Um, Stalin, Stalin had been growing closer to Lenin in his final years. Lenin and Trotsky were the two ideological, the two theor theorist stars of the Communist Party. Stalin was not known as a theorist, he was known as a doer. But Stalin excelled in one area of Communist Party ideology, and that was as an interpreter of Lenin. His interpretations of Lenin's thought were actually fairly well regarded among other theorists in the Communist Party. And he gained some respect, albeit grudging, uh, from some of his would-be competitors for power when Lenin was already still alive as an interpreter of Lenin's thought and as a bearer of the memory of Lenin and Leninism. He also has another critical uh, thing going for him. And that is that he is the only member of the party since the death of a man named Yakov Sverdlov, who was sort of one of the Stalins before Stalin, as you could think of them. He was one of the only members of the party who occupied a very prominent position in both the Communist Party and uh, in the Politburo, the decision-making branch of the Communist Party leadership, and in something that gets a lot less attention, but which was utterly crucial for Stalin's rise to power. A, an institution called the Org Bureau. Sometimes probably it feels as though HR has, has come to take over our worlds, all the rules that we follow in order to do our, our jobs. HR has always been extremely significant. HR is how Stalin seized the dictatorship of the Soviet Union, effectively. By some accounts, the apparatus of power, which is to say the power to name people to jobs, through this institution called the Org Bureau, was in Stalin's hands as early as late 1921. Um, Lenin ran the, the Soviet regime, as I mentioned, out of a different, a different part of the state, something called the Sovnarkom. Stalin, meanwhile, was building up this alternative structure through the Communist Party, through this Org Bureau, that enabled him to appoint people to jobs, which was tremendously useful to him personally as a means of political maneuvering and political leverage. Through this machine that he was building, this Rolodex, he attracts and arranges people who in turn develop personal loyalties to him, and most critically, he collects information about people all across that big map that I showed you. There are rumors, these are unproven, but the fact that there's a rumor about this tells you everything you need to know there was a rumor in the 1920s that Stalin had a special kind of telephone. He had a switchboard, effectively, in his office, the Kremlin switchboard, that allowed him to, you can picture the way that those switchboards used to work, that you pull a plug out from one and you put it into a different, different plug to hear a different conversation. The rumor was that Stalin had a switchboard that let him listen in on all the telephone conversations that were going in and out of the Kremlin at any given time. And there's something wonderfully tactile about that image of Stalin sitting in front of his switchboard. It, it's a great metaphor for his power because it's both about this omniscience, this idea that Stalin knows everything that is going on. Now, it's only really in one memoir that there is any kind of evidence, a memoir from a, from a dissident exile, no less, that any kind of evidence that Stalin actually had a switchboard like this. It's the rumor that matters. People thought Stalin might have that switchboard. Or they joked about Stalin having that switchboard. And maybe it was partly a joke. Maybe it wasn't totally a joke. Maybe Stalin did have that kind of switchboard. And then there's also the technology capacity, the network idea. I like that image for Stalin's power and how it was built up. Russia, as, as you will surely recall from the speaker on Lenin, fought a civil war. Uh, to, to establish Bolshevik power across the territory of the former Russian Empire. As that wound down in early 1921, Stalin oversaw the creation of what was effectively a new office for HR within this org bureau. It was called Uchras Pryod. 
It had a spring, you can tell how much it's growing by the fact that in the spring of 1920, it had a staff of nine. And just six months later, it had a staff of 30. It created cards with people's names on them and their work experience. By 1922, it has cards on more than 23,500 people. That is enormous, that kind of expansion. 1922 is the year when Stalin takes this office in hand and his power grows exponentially as he does so. He installs his political ally and friend, Vyacheslav Molotov, who lived forever. He was born in 1890. He died in 1986. He uh, is one of our great sources on this period. He wrote some memoirs. Uh, at the head of the party secretariat, and he installs another ally who also lived forever, Lazar Kaganovich. The irony of ironies being that they were more or less the only two of Stalin's close associates to survive the purge, and they did not die. Uh, to set up a department of statistics within Uchraspryod to make it more efficient. So basically, what you're seeing here, before, Stalin, before Lenin is even dead, Stalin has put in place a framework for his dictatorship because he is rationalizing this new kind of apparatus that is an HR apparatus that is going to staff this new Soviet state. Lenin is not dead yet. And there is the potential for a new kind of Stalinist dictatorship already kind of percolating up here. Um, dictatorships, and this is one of the big points that I want to make. Dictatorships don't grow on trees. There's this myth, you know, we talk, oh, democracy is hard. Democracy is really hard. Keeping people, democracy is really tough. Thing is, so is dictatorship. You can have autarky, you can have collapse, you can have two states, civil war. A consolidated, strong dictatorship like the kind that Stalin built is enormously difficult to accomplish. This is one of the ways that he does it, through this system that comes to be known, the nomenklatura system, that is in place until the end of the Soviet Union. And here's the thing that's remarkable, is that that system extended rapidly beyond the party. The Utras Pirot is so effective that it comes to be consulted not just for appointments, personnel appointments to party positions in all these cities across the Soviet Union, but also to state positions. So why doesn't the Communist Party, the conspiracy that was the Communist Party, die? You don't need it anymore. You've seized power. You're above ground. Why doesn't it die? Because it becomes the most effective way of staffing this new apparatus with political loyalists, which is what Stalin oversees. So this is, this is kind of a genius moment. You know, this is the other myth about dictatorships, is that these people, they're brutes. They're brutes and thugs. <coughs> Stalin may have been both a brute and a thug, but there was also a kind of political genius in his activity that you can see in this organizational structure that he concocted. So he's got these three pieces in place. The Communist Party generates not just political authority in the population, but administrative power. The Communist Party is unified. This was a gift of Lenin's to Stalin before he dies. In 1921, he puts through a decree called On Party Unity that makes it illegal to contravene or disagree effectively publicly with party statements. And the administrative apparatus exists. This is what Stalin's got going for him when Lenin dies on January 21st, 1924. Um, his brain filled with blood, a condition that his father likely shared that resulted in clogging of arteries to the brain. This was obsessively detailed in press reports. Every nitty gritty, all of the sort of bloody events of Lenin's dying process are tracked, albeit at a, at a several days remove, in the Soviet press. The night that he dies, his sister places a call to the Communist Party Congress that is meeting in Moscow to the Presidium asking for Stalin or Zinoviev, the two leading contenders to take over after Lenin dies. Stalin is the one who came to the phone. He has a different leader, a guy named Kalinin, break the news to the Congress. Screams and sobs break out. They pierce the hall. Kamenev and Zinoviev, other leading Bolsheviks, openly weep at the Presidium. They had all uh, viewed Lenin's body 
The night before, to kiss him goodbye, to bid a personal farewell, Stalin kissed his cheeks and lips as the sculptor arrived to make a death mask. And Stalin and the others began to prepare the funeral. Here's young Stalin, just a little bit before these events. And here is Lenin and Stalin at Gorky. Lenin, this is in between his two strokes. Lenin and Stalin at Gorky, where Lenin died. And here is Stalin with the members of the inner circle that he is in the process of building. Certain members of this inner circle were absent at Lenin's death, and it was a critical absence. Most notably absent was Leon Trotsky, who was, in many respects, Stalin's chief rival for power after Lenin's death. Trotsky himself was ill at the time, and he was depressed over Stalin's effective and merciless persecution of him in the party press. Stalin had the man to his left in this photograph, Nikolai Bukharin, who was one of the younger leading lights of Soviet ideologues rising up and the editor of Pravda, the, the main party newspaper at the time. Stalin had tasked Bukharin with destroying Trotsky in the press, and Bukharin was doing a hell of a job. Trotsky was depressed, and just a few days before Lenin's death, he was also ill. He left for Suhum, Suhumi, a resort town in Georgia, he got word of Lenin's death when he was already 1,000 miles away. He telegraphs back that he's returning to Moscow immediately, but Stalin replies, don't bother. You won't make it in time. We're having the funeral on Saturday, January 26th. Now, Trotsky at this moment was commissar of war. He had, in addition to being a brilliant um, the theoretician, he was also a brilliant uh, organizer. He was the commissar of war that effectively whipped the Red Army in shape in order to win the Civil War. He had the entire military at his disposal. Trotsky did, is the thing. Who was to stop Trotsky from getting off the train, going over to the nearest air base? It was about 40 miles away, as it happened, commandeering a plane, flying back to Moscow. Maybe Trotsky could have just turned the train around and gone back to be at the funeral, to have himself in the picture, that were, the pictures that were about to be broadcast all across the country, Lenin's death, Lenin's funeral. Trotsky didn't do it. He didn't do it. He backed down. And so this is another piece of Stalin's rise. He had an excellent choice of opponent in Trotsky, which is that Trotsky seated the ground to him at this critical moment. Um, Tr Stalin was lucky in his choice of opponents. And so, because Trotsky doesn't come, Trotsky was the orator of the two of them, the Trotsky-Stalin question. Trotsky was the one who could get up and rally the troops. That was part of how he won the Civil War. Instead, Stalin gets to give the speech, and he gives a powerful, almost religious speech. Like I said, it had the imprint of his time as a seminarian. These were his words in front of Lenin's grave. Um, Departing from us, Comrade Lenin enjoined us to hold high and safeguard the purity of the great title of member of the party. We vow to thee, Comrade Lenin, we shall fulfill thy behest with honor. Departing from us, Comrade Lenin enjoined to us to safeguard the unity of the party as the apple of our eye. We vow to thee, Comrade Lenin, that this too, thy behest, we shall fulfill with honor. Um, so Stalin is in an excellent position for taking control of this apparatus. There's one thing that's standing in his way, unfortunately, and that is Lenin's own words. Lenin, and there is some argument about the authenticity of this document, but Lenin left something behind that came to be known as the Testament, in which he, uh, scurrilous intriguer that he was, assessed all of the people who might take power after him. He assessed guys like Kamenev, Zinoviev, Bukharin sitting there with Stalin, and Stalin himself. Vadashilov, who's to Stalin's right, he didn't even bother assessing. Vadashilov was not a contender for power. The Testament, um, there are some who think that Lenin's wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, had a hand in writing it. There are some who think that his sister had a hand in writing it. It seems almost certain that Krupskaya um, tried to manipulate the, the document such that she could be sure it would come to public knowledge, in part because she reviled Stalin. 
Um, Lenin's assessments were more or less ruinous for everyone he named. For Zinoviev and Kamenev, he wrote, they are excellent uh, organizers, and we shouldn't hold against them the fact that they opposed me in 1917 and didn't think the time was right for the October coup. Thus reminding everybody that they had opposed him in 1917 and didn't think that the time was right for the October coup. Bukharin was a gifted theoretician, but maybe too much of a theoretician to seize power in Lenin's view. Trotsky was educated and urbanized, but he also displayed, according to Lenin, quote, excessive self-assurance, which left Stalin. Of, of him, Stalin wrote, having become, er, Lenin wrote, Comrade Stalin, having become general secretary, has concentrated boundless power in his hands, and I am not sure whether he will always be able to use that power with sufficient caution. Talk about some foresight there. Lenin saw it coming down the pike. But he did nothing. He didn't remove Stalin ahead of time. He didn't try to curb his power. He needed Stalin. He needed him to get out there and organize this, this union. Um, the authenticity of this de testament has nowhere been confirmed, but what matters more are its effects. It was treated as, if not real, then at least very significant within the party's inner circle. They cared what it said. Its existence reinforced Stalin's natural paranoia. And for the others, it provides an opportunity to remove Stalin. If you guys are worried, Lenin is saying from beyond the grave, so am I. Maybe act on that worry. Lenin, Stalin decides the only way to face the testament is head on. And so in 1924, he raises it himself at a meeting of the party elite. And he says, listen, Stal Lenin said in the Testament that I'm rude. He's right. I'm rude. I am, too much so. I offend people with my rudeness. And what do they do? The Kamenevs, the Zinovievs, the Bukharans, what do they do? Instead of being like, you know, you know, this might not be the job for you. You're right, Stalin. Thank you. But we'll, we'll sort of take it, take it from here. They scream out back from the, he's up at the podium, they yell back, we're all rude, we're communists. No, you can't resign. No, you must stay. And you could debate why they do that for hours, but that's what happens. That's one reading of a demonstration of the personal charisma that Stalin wielded over his inner circle. That's a critical building block of his dictatorship, this personal charisma. Or we could conclude, and I think that both of these are true, that Stalin was not yet fully Stalin. That even those closest to him did not yet see what he is capable of and the sort of violence that he would ultimately author. And that's what we're going to turn to now. Stalin and power. How did Stalin project his power across the Soviet Union? Um, the Civil War and war communism had devastated Russia, particularly Soviet agriculture. Lenin pushed through a policy called the New Economic Policy to bring it back. The Bolsheviks were unhappy with the New Economic Policy. They felt that it wasn't communism because it wasn't communism. It was the market, and they didn't like that. And that's understandable. But Lenin had said, we needed breathing space. We need to let the peasants grow their grain. We need to let them sell it if we're going to get agriculture back up and running. Remember, we're more than 80% peasant. That's our whole economy. Remember how we need to get stuff from abroad? What are we going to sell to get the stuff we need from abroad? Grain, that's it. We got to do this new economic policy thing. And Stalin is the enforcer on that, until he isn't. Until in 1927, Stalin begins to lead the charge to draw the new economic policy to an end and to move into what he considers the next stage of socialist development. How to make this great leap, though, without selling your grain abroad? How do you accumulate the capital you need to get the stuff that will help you industrialize? Because socialism is nothing without a working class. And they still don't have one. And if you're a communist, and make no mistake, Stalin is a communist, as are all of these guys. 
The fact that you don't have a working class makes you very uncomfortable. Since the First World War, uh, the Soviets had watched European nations try to print their way out of this economic crisis that they were all in. And it hadn't worked. Um, they turned to the new economic policy to have a hard commodity to sell. The new economic policy, however, Stalin leads its abandonment in 1928 in what's known as the Great Break, after an article Stalin published in Pravda that year. There were a number of different reasons for this break. One of them is more political intriguing. One of them is sort of the last, the last nail in Trotsky's coffin. Trotsky was very opposed to the new economic policy, and now Stalin is going to get out ahead of him by seizing that platform as his own. It was a classic Lenin move, in fact. That's what Lenin did in 1917. Um, but so Stalin launches the first five-year plan, this great break, as the stepping stone to socialism, which has two components. It has the collectivization of agriculture and industrialization. The origins of this program lay in the Bolshevik understanding of what socialism is and how the Soviet Union is going to get there in a hostile world. What socialism is, no one knows precisely. There was no guidebook from Marx. The debates of the 1920s are attempts to find a way toward this unknown thing, this utopia of development without the capitalist trajectory that they have witnessed so far in the world around them. Um, so the one thing socialism is for sure is non-capitalism. That's the only thing that they're certain of. So how do you do that? Well, you've got to industrialize without capitalism, and you've got to make massively productive agriculture without capitalism. How is the Soviet Union going to get there in this hostile surrounding world? This world is pressing on them. This was one of the great surprises of the revolutionary period. They know they're not following Marx, that Russia's not supposed to go first in the turn to socialism. But they think that maybe if they light the match, the rest of the world will catch on fire, too. And then it doesn't. And how they're going to deal with that conundrum, they're gonna, that's going to be one of the big questions of Soviet politics until 1991. Stalin's answer is this two-pronged collectivization, industrialization, enterprise. Um, there's no way to do it except through the technology from the West. Construction is undertaken. They build these massive industrial programs. These, the Moscow Metro is one of the manifestations of this modernization drive. How are you modern? You get a metro, you get a subway like everyone else, you build blast furnaces like the Western nations hugely successfully. The working class grows from 3 million people in 1928 to 11 million people in 1937. Um, in the West at this moment, there's unemployment. This is very auspicious for Stalin that, that Western capitalist countries are tanking out with the Great Depression just as he is building up this huge infrastructure. There's unemployment in the West, and here in the Soviet Union, there's full employment. There's workers living in shanty towns. They can't afford their apartment in the West. Here in the Soviet Union, there's workers living in shanty towns. But that's because we haven't built the new beautiful cities yet. We're getting there, though. Take a look at that metro. We're making a start. We've only been at this 10 years. You guys have been doing it for 110. So you want to talk about how it is that people are believing across 11 time zones. You don't need the whole world around you to be suffused with perfect utopia to think that maybe we're going to get there. When you see metro stations like this, when you see blast furnaces like that, when you've got new pictures of agriculture coming out of the works. But the village is a problem. The village was backward. Um, and the village is full of peasants, and peasants are not party members. How am I, I've got, I have about not much time left, Jack, is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, all right, we got a lot to get through. Collectivization uh, is the, the shift from peasants who collect grain by hand, who use horses, 
and horse-drawn plows to this, to tractors. And how do you do that? You don't do it. It's not the story of the United States where people go west and slowly, slowly those farms get bigger and bigger until they become agro-business. Well, you're going to have to do it violently in the Soviet Union. You're going to have to do it through the prism of the class enemy, which is what Stalin is a master of, something called the kulak. Dekulakization. What was a kulak? The answer, hard to say, is it someone who has three cows? Four cows, maybe? Where do you draw the line? It differs. It varies from one place to the other. Who's a kulak or who's not? But they get an order that comes down from Moscow, authored by Stalin, to divide all the populations in all the villages across the Soviet Union into three categories. Group one, the kulaks, the most dangerous, the counter-revolutionary kulaks. They were to be arrested, sent to the prison networks. Group two, who were the richest kulaks, but not necessarily political threats, they were to be sent into bare land that had not been settled or cultivated in any way, that was barren. They would not be given supplies for building houses. They lived under the open sky that first winter. More than half of them perished not in camps, but just under the stars, living in huts. And group three, was everyone else, the remaining kulaks, slated for total collectivization. They were allowed to keep their tools and they were resettled into existing villages throughout the region. Now, when you think about the enthusiasm for communism, one of the ways that manifests is in massive overfulfillment, even of this plan. There were supposed to be 60,000 members of Group 1 across the Soviet Union. The actual number turned out to be 283,000. Group two, for example, was anticipated to be around two million. It ended up being double that. Group one suffered the most, the counter-revolutionary kulaks, and all about 30,000 heads of household were executed in the collectivization waves that broke across the Soviet Union that year. Five million people were dekulakized, which is to say they were dispossessed of their houses and sent out into these settlements in the middle of nowhere. You think to yourself, why didn't people rise up against that? The, the answer is they did. All over. They rose up against it. Those who protested were suppressed by the political police, in part. There were members of the elite who rose up against it. There was a plot in 1932. A group of political members of the political elite, elite gathered together in an apartment, wrote a, a platform called Stalin, the problem of political dictatorship, the Ryutin platform, it was known as. But the secret police got word of the meeting. They obtained copies of the platform. They arrested everyone involved, confirming Stalin's natural paranoia, which explodes in the later part of the decade in the Great Terror. Um, the terror begins in 1934. There have been political trials that Stalin has authored throughout this period. His natural paranoia uh, resonates with the inbuilt political paranoia of the Bolshevik party, a conspiracy that's in power. These two things feed on each other. Stalin's natural paranoia with this political paranoia, the systemic paranoia. This idea that everyone's, everyone who's against me is an enemy. That, I, that kind of talk. Um, and on December 1st, 1934, Stalin's best friend and the head of the Communist Party in the city of Leningrad to the north, Sergei Kirov, is executed. Here's Kirov. Uh, excuse me, he's assassinated. He's murdered in his office. Kirov had risen under Stalin's patronage. He was the head of the party organization in Azerbaijan, next door to Georgia, where Stalin is from before being brought up to Leningrad. Um, he, is, uh, he is assassinated by a disaffected party member by the name of Nikolaev. Um, by every available piece of evidence, Nikolaev acted by himself. And he acted because there are two versions of the story. One is that he was a disaffected party member whose life had kind of tanked. He found himself unemployed, not really going anywhere. The second story, there is some evidence of this too, is that Kirov was sleeping with his wife. We don't know. Either way, Nikolaev shot Kirov. 
uh, on December 1st, 1934. Um, Stalin told the NKVD to look for Kirov's murderer, not in the person of Nikolaev who pulled the trigger, but in the Zinoviavites, his old political enemy. He saw conspiracies everywhere, and other people saw them too. He had this political police at his disposal, and they are over-fulfilling the plan, just like the collectivizers over-fulfilled the plan. So Nikolaev was charged with the murder together with 14 other conspirators who he'd never met. Well, a couple of them he had met, to be fair. Uh, but meant several of them he hadn't. They were all put on trial. They were executed in January 35, together with Stalin's arch enemies, Zinoviev and Kamenev. The following year, another political show trial is held that leads to the execution of 77 other former oppositionists, people who back in these struggles in the 1920s, what is socialism, we're not sure. Stalin goes after them in the 1930s. Um, Initially, they're sentenced to 10 years in, in concentration camps. One of the things that's fairly remarkable, however, is that they all confess to their crimes. Um, not everyone, but, but Zinoviev and Kamenev both certainly do. And Stalin, after Kirov's death, begins this drumbeat of more and more frequent verification of party cards, expulsions from the party. Um, these party elites are executed uh, in huge numbers in 1937, um, led by Stalin's cronies and the political police. Uh, the Kulak quota for the plan uh, total was 222,650 victims executed uh, as part of the terror in 1937. Um, Half the, ex the executions total in that year is topped out of 370,000. These numbers are very difficult to comprehend. Stalin didn't pull the trigger all across the Soviet Union. People acting on his behalf, in his name, scared of being fingered themselves, next, did. Among the victims of the terror, were uh, members the cream of Soviet society, certainly the cream of the Soviet military. Um, in May 1937, Stalin accuses of treason one of the greatest military leaders of the Soviet Red Army, Marshal, Marshal Tukhachevsky, and launches something called the Trial of Generals, in which Tukhachevsky is tried and ultimately executed with seven other high-ranking generals. By the end of the purge of the military, 34,000 officers had been dismissed from the armed forces. 11,000 were ultimately reinstated, reinstated, but still that meant that 22,000 were not, the vast majority of whom were executed or died in prison. After the purge, the USSR has lost two of its marshals, 16 generals, 15 admirals, 264 colonels, 107 majors, 71 lieutenants, and right at this moment, Stalin begins to receive intelligence that the Germans are preparing for war. We're going to blow through the war. I understand I don't have much time left. Like I said, Stalin and the Soviet Union in the middle of the century. There's a lot happening. On August 24th, 1939, Stalin believes, having just killed the military establishment, that his country is not ready for war. In terms of industry, they're more ready than they ever have been. Stalin has overseen this massive industrialization campaign. They're producing tanks, they're producing planes, they're producing all kinds of modern military equipment that they'd never had before. But they don't have the personnel and they're still not where they need to be in order to take on the greatest military power that has come back to life even after they were supposed to have suppressed it for good in 1918 with the end of the First World War. Stalin signs the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact to, uh, this is, oh, these are the remaining, this is Zinoviev, Stalin's ally, pictured before his arrest and in his mugshots. You can see he's been worked over. Um, Kamenev doesn't have such visible traces of beating, but he is certainly a broken man. Um, the Germans launch, Stalin tries to hold off the Germans with this Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact 
he really believes that they're going to wait, that, that Hitler will be sated by the territorial agreements that they've made to divide Poland, which is the main outcome of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in 1939. He is receiving copious intelligence in May and June of 1941, however, that the Germans are massing at the new Soviet border. And he's got his arms tied because if he makes some sort of move to counter this accumulation of troops, well, then the Germans get an excuse to invade. But if he does nothing, then the Germans can just invade and he won't be ready. So it's, Stalin's not at fault for the brilliant German military strategy of 1941, but he does have to figure out how to manage it. Um, the Germans launched something called Operation Barbarossa Redbeard on June 22nd, 1941. They envisioned themselves as being liberators of the suppressed Soviet population, and in some places they are indeed greeted as such. This is a break, this is a make or break moment for the Soviet Union. The Germans are coming into this territory. The Soviets have just gone through the, they have just gone through collectivization and the terror respectively. Millions of their people have been killed by their own government. Surely even the Germans are better than that. Surely the Germans think we will be greeted as liberators. But the Germans manage a pretty remarkable feat. They manage to treat the Soviet people because they're Slavs worse than the Soviets did. They think of the Slavic peoples of the Soviet Union as lower, as a lower racial category than themselves. So what do they do? They do things like stopping education at the second grade, closing all schools in lots of places, because why do these people need to learn? They're going to be slave labor in our camps. The Germans succeed in treating the Soviets worse than the Soviets had. They are not welcomed as victors. As, as, as liberators. Um, in the first three weeks, the Soviets suffered 750,000 casualties in the war. So yeah, Stalin made some mistakes. The Soviet Union was perhaps unprepared for the German onslaught. They lose 10,000 tanks and 4,000 aircraft. Um, by the end of 1941, the Germans had captured 3 million prisoners of war, most of whom were dead within months because, again, they see no reason to keep these people alive. Um, nevertheless, this was not the quick victory Hitler had hoped, largely because of the efforts of Georgi Zhukov, a brilliant military leader who uh, led the charge against the Germans. Um, the German general on August 11th, 1941, relayed back to Berlin, at the beginning of the war, we calculated there would be about 200 divisions against us, but we have already counted 360 they are not armed and equipped according to our understanding of these words. The Soviet soldiers often did not have guns. They were throwing bodies at the Germans. They are not armed or equipped according to our understanding of these words. Their tactical leadership is not very satisfactory, but they exist. And if we destroy a dozen regiments, the Russians present us with another dozen. That, in a nutshell, is the story of the Second World War and how the, the Soviets won it. Um, I will not go through each and every battle. These were not Stalin's victories per se, except insofar as Stalin's great strength at this moment was to realize when he was not the person in command, when Zhukov was the person in command. Not all dictators have that wisdom, and Stalin did which is significant. Um, the total losses of the Second World War are impossible to comprehend. The numbers are so large. There are 15 million, million military deaths on both sides, between 35 and 45 million civilian deaths. The Soviet losses amount to fully half of the military deaths. They lost 7 million men fighting in that war. The Germans suffered 3 million dead, and they lost. The Soviets suffered 7 million and they won. There are 20 million Soviet civilians' deaths. There are no men left 
in that generation in that country. There is an entire generation of humanity that is wiped out. They are still recovering demographically from what that war did. The reason it's still so alive there, try and get over a loss of that magnitude as a society. It is generations that it will take. At the victory celebration, and, and how do you return, how do you come back? The Soviets take contradictory lessons. Here is Stalin on the global stage negotiating, treated as an equal. He has brought the Soviet Union to par with Britain and the United States. Here is Zhukov in Berlin, entering the city with the, with the red, with the, the band. And here is Zhukov receiving the flags of the conquered armies back in the city of Moscow at the end of the war. The Red Army marching into Berlin. A toast to the Russian people. How does this dictatorship, and this is where I'll end, how does it come back from loss of this magnitude? It takes some paradoxical lessons from what it has just accomplished. Namely, it takes the lesson that the 1930s worked. And so, when it comes time to rebuild from that war, they've lost over a third of their factories. They've lost 20 million plus people. They rebuild the economy of the 1930s. And ironically, just as the British were behind because they industrialized first by the end of the 19th century, the Soviets end up behind because they hang on to this 1930s economy into the 1950s, the 1960s, when other countries are starting to turn away from it. And here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. All those men that you just saw in Berlin, <coughs> oh my God, they're in Berlin. And they're seeing that the German people through this war, that the German people have now lost, they've been living better than them all this time. They've been eating more. They've got record players in every household. They've seen it with their own eyes. And they've fought the German enemy and won. The terror isn't possible after the Second World War, the way that it was beforehand. And you can see this in the way the generals respond, because Zhukov, Zhukov is a pretty impressive figure in Soviet society after that victory, you can bet. And Stalin knows it. And you know, starting in 46, 47, Stalin starts to move against the generals again. He starts to try to launch a purge of the military. And this time, they don't let it happen. This time, the generals close ranks around Zhukov. And Zhukov is demoted. He gets sent to some Black Sea province. But he lives. And this also is the story across all of the Soviet Union. It's, you, know, you see it on the top of the regime, but you see it down low, too, is that these guys have been out there. And they have done something that the Soviet Union, that Stalin's regime, is not solely the author of. So Stalin brings them through his industrialization campaigns to this victory, and then this victory is the thing that ultimately starts to lay the seeds for the decay of the power that he has built over all these years. Um, Stalin's death in 1953 will pose enormous problems for this regime because it has not known a way to function without terror. And communism, as has been built, as we talked about, when Stalin takes power, what is socialism? It's a mess. He gives it substance. Stalin does. So what's its substance after Stalin's gone? That's what he leaves them with. And that's where I'll end. Thank you. I apologize for going so long.